in a dream and say, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophets. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus, the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord. The word of God is precious. It's God-breathed. And it's profitable for teaching, correction, rebuking, and training of righteousness. So that the man of God and the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We commit this moment into your hands, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. The topic is God with us. This is Christmas, one week. God with us. I want to pick up verse 23 and expound on verse 23. The, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And he, they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Three words, God with us. John Wesley, the great founder of the Methodist Church, as he was dying... The last words were, the best of all is, God with us, Emmanuel. The last words of, of uh, John Wesley is, God with us. You know how encouraging this is? That's why I picked this one. How strengthening it is to know that God is with us. Not a guru with us, not a prophet with us. How often we've gone through discouraging time or disappointment. Oh, then we know God is with us. This society is so broken, we need that. This is why I'm continually refreshed, rejuvenated, because the presence of God. God with us is the presence of God with us. It is so comforting to know that 2,000 years ago, the Son of God came to, with us and became with us. I got three points and three applications this morning. Oh, you got it. <laughs> the my one, Jesus is God. Okay, so it says here, the virgin will have a child and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. His name is God with us. His name is not only God. Because in the Old Testament, there's, there's a lot of instances of Yahweh, God. But there is never an official name of Yahweh as God with us. He's God, but he's never God with us. Now in the New Testament, the New Covenant, Jesus is God. The second person of Trinitarian God, he is God. And his name is God with us. He's not only God, He's with us. So first of all, I want to unpack the word God with us. That means that Son is God, first of all. So Jesus is God. Let me tell you this. The meaning of Christmas is God became a, uni a human being. That's the meaning of Christmas. The meaning of Christmas, God has become a hu human being. And that's the definition of Christmas. Everything else is secondary. Everything is secondary. Everything else flows from that. If you don't get that, Christianity is gone. There's no Christianity. Christmas is, is the very definition of Christianity. Christmas defines the hope of mankind. Christmas gives us the hope for eternity like nothing has ever, se ever seen. John chapter 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, that is Jesus, Son of God. And said the Word was with God. The, Son God. the Son of God is with God the Father, and the Word was God, and the Son of God is God. Acts 20, 28 says, Pay a careful attention to yourself and all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Did you see that? Paul said, uh, Paul said, overseers, leaders, look after the church and care for the church of God. Which is, who is the God here? He obtained with his own blood. It's, this verse is saying God obtained this church with his own blood. It didn't say Jesus obtained this church with his own blood. It's God obtained this church with his blood. God, in other words, God purchased the church 
with his own blood. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is God. You know when Jesus said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. He's saying that every sin ever committed in this world is committed against him. Did you know that? He said, how can you forgive sins if, if, if you are not the person being, being victimized? You know, somebody, uh, you know, great stories like, uh, like uh, Amish. Amish children were killed. That was a long time ago by this gunman and the, the mental case. And, and the funeral, uh, you know, before the funeral, the, the, the Amish parents actually went to talk to the parents of this, of this killer. We forgive him. It's a very, very powerful moving story. If I have, it showed up in New York Times everywhere. Books written about it. How did the Amish people forgive someone who killed their own children? It's, it's, I won't go into details, but I just suffice to say that the Amish parents can say, we forgive you because the victims is their children. How did Jesus save the paralyzed man? Son, your sins are forgiven. He is saying that you sin against me. How can Jesus go about forgive, saying that? When Daniel bows down to an angel, when the angel appeared to Daniel, Daniel bowed down to him. Angel said, get up. I'm a creature like you. But when Thomas bowed down to Jesus, Jesus receives it. Jesus is not a creation. He's the Yahweh, beginless, and he is uncreated being. He is God, he is creator. Jesus is saying, I have no beginning. Never a time when I was not. Listen to this carefully. Now, <laughs> the issue is not what he claimed. I went through this last Sunday, right? The issue is not just what he claimed, what Jesus claimed that he is God. The issue is his followers believed him. That's a big one. There's even bigger one. You can say what you want, but do people follow you? Do people believe in you? That's a key one. And that makes it even more intoxicating because, let me tell you the story. New York Times book review on the historical Jesus. There's a book published years, years ago called about the historical Jesus. Many books written about it. Okay, this, and this is just one of them. There was a Jewish scholar, Jewish scholar, who's not a Christian, he reviewed the book and he said, this book doesn't really deal with the real issue. But the real issue in Christianity, he said this, the Jewish man, the real issue in Christianity is why did Jesus' disciples and his followers decide to worship him? That's the one no Jewish man will understand. If you know, let me give you the story, the background. Jews never believe a man, a human being, could be God. That's an even harder thing to prove. Jesus said he's God, he did all the miracles, but for people, for the Jewish people to believe in his God, that is totally mind-blowing. Now let me give you some background. Have you heard of Krishna, right? The Krishna, Hinduism, Krishna folks, they have this high God consciousness in the sense that you know, when, when Hare Krishna people, Hindus say, he is God, he is God, what he means is God is in every person. So when the, the, this is what they, it is called pantheist. Pantheist is the people who believe God is in everyone. So when, when you call somebody his God, it means a little G, little God, because God is in everyone. It's no big deal, right? So they have that view, God is in everything. Now, the Jews are not pantheists. The Jews are not polytheists. Polytheist means many gods. The Jews believe in the God of the Bible, like us. You see how close we are to the Jewish people? Pray for them, folks. There's a lot of them in, in Long Island. Pray for them. The God of the Bible was an uncreated creature without beginning, without beginning, transcending the, tra infinitely transcending the universe. Beautiful words. The God of Christianity transcends infinitely the whole universe. Infinitely greater than the universe, and the universe is just a speck of dust to him. Let's put this in perspective. Now, 
How do the people who lived with him, the Jewish people, Peter, James, and John, the closest people who lived with Jesus, how did they believe Jesus is God? The answer is this. They have seen a moral glory along with the claims that Jesus made. They also seen the trans transcendent personal greatness, transcendent personal greatness, believe it or not, match the claim that the man was claiming. Now, let me tell you, I was listening to the gospel on the way here, Doreen in the car. Jesus was in the boat. The storm hit the boat real big time. He was sleeping. He was sleeping. And the disciples quickly woke him up. Master, master, we are perishing. He got up. And he just rebuked the wind. Stop, wind. Blow it. Stop right now. Boom. Stopped. And he turned around to the disciples. Where is your faith? So they say, who is this man? Even the wind and the storm obey him. Do you see that? They saw the transcendent glory of this man called Jesus. Literally five feet away, they saw him in action. Do you, do, do you have trouble to, for, for, to understand why Jewish people, it was impossible to believe a human could be God after seeing these things? What do you think is going through their minds? Another one, I was listening. There was, a, there's a, there was a, there's a Jewish woman, I think she's a widow, or, or the poor woman whose young son died. A lot of people were crying for the son in the, the funerals, and Jesus passed by. And Jesus said, cry not. The young man is alive. They all laughed. And he spoke to the young man, stand up, wake up. The young, young man woke up. And quickly, and Jesus told the mother, somebody give him some food to eat. And everyone was stunned. He raised a dead man. He loved, not only raised, he loved us. They see a God man who loved us. Can you imagine after all this thing, what is going through their minds? So, after seeing all these things, there's only one conclusion. And he walked on water too. He walked on the sea. All these people who lived with him, who were willing to die for him. They not just believed in him. They were willing to die for him. In fact, Peter died, martyred, crucified, upside down. Paul, I think, is beheaded on the spot. A lot of them. To that intensity. Oh, I shared it with my mom. Friday. I quote the verse, you know, Chinese culture, family is everything. And there is a verse. I preached last Sunday, so I thought it was good for my mom. I shared in Mandarin, you know, I spoke to her in Mandarin. I said, Jesus said, if you don't love me, if you love your parents, your children, your wife, and your, and, and your family more than me, you are not worthy of my follower. I said that two times to my mom, and she was shocked. She was stunned. I mean, she has been a Christian every Sunday going to church for 40 years, perhaps. Methodist Christian. I have all the respect and honor for my mom. When I said that, I know it's going to grip her. And I'm her son. I shared it with her. And she said quietly, I don't want to criticize the Bible. But that passage is hard. So I explain more to her so that she gets it more. My point is this. This man... It's so powerful, he claimed the impossible, and he demands the impossible from us. How do you deal with that? Have you wrestled with this that way? Are you willing to put your life on the line for, 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 for Jesus the way they did? One thing's for sure. This explains why Christianity is so exclusive. This explains the exclusivity of Christianity. You, have you heard people that say, why well, are you Christians so exclusive? Only Jesus, all the earth. Is this fair? Every religion says our founder is a great leader who teaches you how to live. If you live it this way, if you do it this way, you get to God. Morality and goodness are good enough. Let me tell you this. A lot of Christians come to church, carry their morality baggage into our lives, into the church. Just because you're a Christian, it doesn't mean that you are clear of all this, including me. We all carry our emotional, spiritual, cultural baggage into our lives, into the church. And let me tell you this, there's a lot of moralist, moralistic Christians. Christianity comes along and say, 
No, your situation is so dire that morality and goodness will never be good enough. You see, the point is, morality, no matter how moral you try to be and be good and all this, it's never good enough because we are, our situation is so dire. It's like a person in the third stage cancer or whatever, I, you know, is really desperate. You know, there is no help anymore. They sent him to the hospice or whatever it is. Spiritually, we are in that condition. But we think by doing good deeds, we can still pull it off. So the sooner and the better we understand this, how die, how depraved we are, our spiritual conditions in our own life, the better it is. The unique son of God himself had to come to die for you. You have to put all your hope, your rest, and trust in him. That's the way to get saved. The way to get salvation is put all your hope, all your trust, all your rest in Jesus. Is that exclusive? Some people say Christianity is very narrow. It is so, you know, if, if a doctor, there are five doctors give, give us, let's say, a patient five diagnoses. Everyone, four of them is the same, or one is different. So you, you say to the guy with the different diagnosis, who could be right? You are so narrow. Do you call this narrow? It's not narrow. It's either right or wrong, but not narrow. Christianity is either right or wrong. You can accept it. Jesus is right or wrong. You can accept it and run with all your heart for him. Serve him. Put your life in him. Put all your trust and hope in him. Or you reject him. Walk away. But you cannot say he's narrow. He's being unreasonable. If Christmas is right, everything else about Christianity makes sense. The miracles, exclusive claims, the need for just good works, the need for good works, but complete rest and trust to Christ. If Christmas is wrong, everything else falls apart. Now we come to point two, God with us. First is He is God. Second point is God with us. Second point. This is a beautiful part, right? Everybody loves it because he is God. He's with us. This part is beautiful and soft. You like that? The great God with all his majesty, with all his majesty, infinitely greater than the universe, put himself in the form of likeness. Witness, sorry, witness. Jesus emptied his glory, came to this world to be with us. And not only with us, to become like one of us without sins. He has come alongside. He has entered into pers hum intimate human personal relationship with us. Personal relationship with us. Now let me tell you this. Before Jesus came to this world, in the Old Testament, you got nothing like this. Everything was terrifying. In the Old Testament, when the people came to Job, when, when, when God appeared to Job, what did God say to Job? Where were you when I created the world? Where were you? Answer me. It's a whirlwind, a tornado, and hurricane. You know, when, when, when God descended on Mount Sinai with Moses, was rumbling, thunders, that's how God came to Israel. Compared to Christmas. When God appeared to Abraham, he appears as smoking fire, moving through the air. When God appeared to Moses, to the children of Israel, I said, like, pillar of fire and all this. And when, and when, when, the, when God appeared to Israel in the temple, the people of Israel, Moses and Solomon saw the Shekinah glory. So powerful and majestic that people could not get into the room, could not get into the temple. The, 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 the glory and the Shekinah glory of God came down. It was so powerful, so beautiful. You know, so, so when Moses asked to see God, Moses talked to God, God, show me thy presence. Show me thy presence. And God told him, you can't see my face. If you see my face, you will die. That's Old Testament. You see me, you die. However you can see my back, I'll show you my back. So that's what he did. I will show you my back. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. You can't see my face. So that's all it is. You see, that's all people of Israel could 
manage with seeing the, the, the transcendent God, to experience the God, <coughs> experience the God with us. Even Moses said, plead with God. Very different. Until Jesus show up. Now, we get into the presence of God. Very, very different. You see, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 4, Paul says, Moses has put a veil over his face. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he spent time in the presence of God. His, his face shined with the glory of God. So much that the, is, the Israelites pleaded with him, please cover your face, hurting our eyes. Even. Bible said that was a, that was a covenant that, that actually kills. That was, a, that was a document that kills because the Ten Commandments kills you. You can never live up to it. But now, Jesus came. He removed all the veil. Because, because in, a, <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians 3, 4, 2 Corinthians 3, 4, it says, God commanded the light to shine out of darkness and shine into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. No one could see God, experience God, but now we can so I, I thought about how did this happen. Let me just give you a quick, simple explanation. You know, in the Old Testament, the, the circumcision is of the flesh. But now in the New Testament, New Covenant, God circumcised our hearts spiritually by the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, God wrote the Ten Commandments on the rock. In the New Testament, the New Covenant, God wrote that Ten Commandments in our hearts. That's the difference. That's where... The presence of God literally came into our personal being. That's why the Holy Spirit dwells within us. That's why you can grieve the Holy Spirit if you do something wrong, because He lives in you. You see how close He is with us now? Before they have to plead with God, Moses said, let me see that presence town. Now He lives in us. We have changed completely the new covenant. Moses will be jumping up and down if he saw every one of you. How did you manage that? Do you realize what this means? I was denied, but you got it. You know, Jesus Christ made you able to meet God. You can know him personally without terror. You can talk to him personally. All of this majestic glory can come to you and embrace you. You can be part of the glory of God. Do you realize what's going on? Do you realize, you know, what doesn't this amaze you? Why isn't this the driving force of your life? If you got this, this should be a driving force for you to live a meaningful life. You get up in the morning, you got something to look forward to, you live for the glory of God. You don't live for your own personal satisfaction, personal achievements, personal glory. You live for the glory of God. Isn't the Westminster Catechism say, I live, the chief end of man is to glorify God. When you glorify God, it gives you the deepest satisfaction. Let me tell you this. God is not, God is not uh, you know, like kind of selfish person. He actually does it for our own good. Martin Luther was very religious for a long time. He was a teacher in the seminary. He was a professor, theo theology professor. He taught the book of Romans. That was all before he became a Christian. He was very busy. He came to church every Sunday. All he did was very Christian. He confessed his sins twice a day, every day two times. He took the sacrament, the uh, communion sacrament. In a sense, he was the person who comes to the musician's concert. He was always hearing the music, but he never met the musicians. He was always in the concert. He was what is called here, Tim Keller called this, he was in God's general presence but he never met God. Do you realize that you can come to church a lot of times and yet you're only in the general presence of God? The question you really need to ask, have you met God? Martin Luther was experiencing God, but he had not actually been with God. One day, as he was reading Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and he said this, I realized all along I have been trying to earn my righteousness and be good on my own merits. And I suddenly realized that in Jesus Christ, He came and He died for me to fulfill all the requirements. And therefore, the righteousness I needed 
to be acceptable to God was something I was given as a gift from Jesus. It's not something I had to work for because I can't be good enough. I cannot get it. You know, I saw the Martin Luther, Martin Luther movie. You should watch that. He pounded on the floor. God, where are you? You see, this, these are the people who changed the world. Even before they came to Christ, they pound the floor. For many Christians, after we come to Christ, we don't knock anything. Luther was pounding the floor. God, why are you so righteous? So difficult to come to you. Until he read Romans 1.17. Keller said this, at the moment he was born again, you know, like, like Luther said, after he read that, that Romans 1.17, at the moment, he, this is what Luther said, I felt I was ushered through open gates into paradise. At that moment, Romans 1.17, when he realized, oh, he's trying to get the righteousness he needed to enter the kingdom of God, it was never good enough, it was never the way. The right way is Jesus did it and gave him the right. Because in the, Romans 1.17, it says, in the gospel, the righteousness of God was revealed to us. Folks, it's never your righteousness, it's the righteousness of God. It's not your moral, moralistic lifestyle, your asceticism, your discipline, what not. It's Jesus. That's why we can put all our trust in Jesus. And Luther said, at that moment, I felt I was ushered through open gates into paradise. Keller said at that moment he was born again. Years after he had entered the ministry, do you know what happened to him? He moved from a general experience of God, knowing Jesus is God with us, until he met God. From general experience of God until to the point of he meets with God. He saw the love of God. He saw the grace of God. He saw the gospel. He moved from just seeing and being with God. So why do you think when God show up, why do you think when God show up in Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago on Christmas Day, he was not a pillar of fire, but he was a baby. What a drastic change from a pillar of fire to a little baby. Vulnerable. No place to sleep. No hotels. They have to move into a manger. Three days, but a month later, the king wanted to kill him. Can you believe that? A baby. King Herod wanted to kill him. Angels have to appear to, most, uh, to, to Joseph and Mary. Run to Egypt. And fulfill the prophetic word out of Egypt, I call my son. What a beautiful. Why would God this time come in the form of a baby? That's a question. The last time was a tornado. This time, the last time was a pillar of fire. Because this time Jesus has come to die. To take away the barrier between us and God. Now, this isn't just God, but this is God with us. Let's go to the third point. God with us. Now, the focus here is us now, okay? Sounds very similar, but I just wanted you to know. Now, the third point is with us, us. Who does God come to be with? Let me ask you this question. In the gospel, in the fall gospel, on the Christmas day, who did the angels appear to? It was the shepherd boys. It was the wise men. It's nothing of the intellectual, powerful, rich people. None of them got it. The moralistic, the self-moralistic Pharisees who done everything, they've got nothing to do with this. Guess what? It's a shepherd boy. The, you see that, if you look at the concept, the context of Christmas text, you see that there's always people who have been invited. Not everyone is invited. Let me tell you, the fact that you are sitting here today, you should be so super thankful to God because you're part of elect, I hope. Not everybody will be part of the elect. Thank you, Philip. So, you know, the people who have not been invited, the people who have been invited, these are humble people. Shepherd boys. Shepherds. Shepherds are the ones who got the invitation. And the astrologers, the outcasts, People are away from society. Why? Why are these kind of people invited? Only these people. You know, not everybody here got with us, you know. Not everybody got to go to heaven in future. The people who can receive this great gift are the people who come without reference. No reference. Without arguments. People who are never, ever 
ever come and say, you owe me, God, because I've tried really hard. None of these people qualify. None of these people are invited. The people invited are the people who are very, who have no arguments. I come without reference to nothing. What, God, what Jesus wants are people who come and say, no reference, you owe me nothing. God, you owe me nothing. I deserve nothing. I'm a shepherd at heart. You have no reason to accept me because of what Jesus has done. I have no reason to ask for anything. That's why we, that's what this is saying, is saying goes this. All you need is nothing. Hallelujah. To come to Christ, all you need is nothing. Who will come to Christianity? Who won't come to Jesus? If you say this to a Muslim, it will freak them out. All you need is nothing to go to heaven. But a lot of people don't have it. A lot of people don't have it. They come with their arms full. They say, I have a hard life. I've done this. I've done that. Surely you've, you should answer my prayers. Surely you should accept me. The us here. God with us. That word us here is the shepherd. And he is God. He is God with us. He is God with us. Okay, let me do three points applications now. And we will end. Three short applications. Number one. Number one. If God is with us, some of you have to take off the limitations you have made for him in your life. You know, we have made limitations in our life. Now, if he is God, if you really believe Jesus is God and you follow God and you know that God is with us, you need to take off some of the limitations in your life. Some of us, some of, some of us have problems in our life and you have problems in your life. You have habits in your life you cannot knock off. You have needs and difficulties in your life. And all of us have that. And you have decided that is just the way things are going to be. You know how people have given out a lot of times in this world? And they become cynical. They just settle. There's nothing I can do anymore. I am, I am just, uh, I am so, that's why depression comes. It comes to a point that I can do nothing anymore. I've given up. You know, that's why things are always so speak. Have you heard like, life as usual? Life as usual is not as usual. You know, when Christmas comes, life cannot be as usual. That's why Paul says to us, says, true Paul says, true Christian love and believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's, in, that's, in, that's what Paul said. Believes all things. Do you know why Paul could talk like that? Paul is a man, he's an outstanding man. He's very unique. He has gone through so much hardship, so much jail, so much shipwrecked, so much flogging and all this thing. He was almost killed many, many times. How could he talk like that? He believed all things. In spite of the jail, he wrote it from the jail. He said, I believe all things. Because he takes sincerely and seriously the idea that Jesus Christ is in the, in the middle of, of his life is God. And he is God. And if he's the one, Jesus, if he's the one who invented the universe and everything, what do you think? Some of the habits that you struggle with, is that a match for him? Is it, what is the bad habits you got? What's the matter with us? You know, especially New Yorkers. I think Long Islanders are too. America in general, we have accumulated so much cynicism in our life about what God can do. You almost mock God. You jeer at God. Jesus, yeah. The sway with the name of Jesus. The cynicism, you know, we got to get rid of the cynicism in our life about what God can do. That has to go first. If that doesn't go, if you are infiltrated, influenced by the culture around you, you will stop the flow and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life right there. Get rid of the cynicism of what God can do through you and what God can do in the church and what God can do through the church. You know, you will not be celebrating Christmas. And you will not be taking it seriously that you are singing and not practicing it as long as you walk around life. If you're a Christian, 
with their heads down, dejected, because you think nothing's going to change. Okay, last, a uh, second application. Christmas is all about getting near him, getting with him. Christmas is all about, Christmas is all about getting near Christ and getting with Christ. Now, let me ask you this question. You heard me. I, I expounded and labor on the points. Jesus, look at what Jesus did to be with you. You know, it's not easy for God to come to be with us. No, to fulfill the Emmanuel, the prophetic word, the prophecy of Emmanuel, the name of Emmanuel, God with us. You know how much Jesus has to suffer? You know how much Jesus has to fight in life? He fought with, like Paul said, he fought with spiritual, the beast of the world in the life. You know how much Jesus had to suffer and endure hardship and shame and he fought it through. The man who walked on water has to receive a spit on his face and stay quiet. The man who caught out the dead man three days already has a stench. Lazarus, he called him out, he walked out. That's the man. And yet he himself being flogged and bleeding with blood all over and hanging on the cross. So, my point is, look at what he did to be with you. He did all this just to be with you, with us. Now I want to ask, now I want to know, what are you going to do to be with him? You see how much Jesus has done to be with us? Now the question is, what are you doing to be with him? What are you going to do? What is keeping you from him? What is keeping us from the sense of the love that God continually put shed in our hearts? How close are you to Him? Are you reading your devotion time? Are you doing your Bible reading devotion daily? How much do you sense His presence in your life? How much of this we are talking about is a reality, not just hearsay? It's a reality. You want it to be real in our lives. Or are they just kind of head knowledge? What's, what's keeping you from getting near to Him? Is it a habit you don't want to give up? Or is it a lack of discipline? Or are you just too busy? Are you too pressed down by other things? You say, well, I wish I had more time for prayer. I, have more, I wish I had more time for this. I have, wish I had more courage. What you mean is, it will cost you. That's what it means. It costs Jesus everything. When we say, I wish I had more time, do this, do that, we are saying that it costs me. That's the unwritten words. But what could, what could it cost you? Another hour a day? Prayer meetings, one hour a day. A week, one week, one hour. And it's by Zoom, so easy. Another day of the week to have a small group, men's group, women's group, or youth group. Another evening of the week, whatever it costs you, let me tell you this, it's nothing compared to what it costs him to get with you. Look at what he's done to get with you. What are you doing with him? You know, Jesus literally, Jesus literally clawed his way through. <laughs> I mean it, clawed. He was whipped. He, he, he sweated blood on the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not easy. Even his God, son, but when he struggled so much, he was a man. Remember that. He was really struggling. It was not easy for him. He sweated blood. Blood and, and sweat. He clawed his way through anything that's keeping you from him. You know, Jesus will fight anything to get, help you to get close to him. That's the meaning of Christmas. God with us. He clawed his way from heaven to earth to get with you. Why in the world can you get out 30 minutes earlier? Just saying. Why in the world you can't get out of work 30 minutes earlier to join prayer? 
You know, I've told you many times, right? Prayer meeting, if you have a heart, talk to me. I'll make it happen for you. But it's all in the heart. You know, why in the world can't you make, the, make room for that schedule? What does it cost you? It's nothing compared to what it costs him to be with us. Get with him. Last, third application. Third application. There may be some people here who will see that if Jesus Christ is God, then your lukewarm and tepid response to him is not a rational one. In other words, if you see Jesus is really God, your response is just not, it's just not, uh, it's just not, it's just not ten, in tension with, 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 with who he is. And your response is not rational. Let's finish with this point. John Stott, in the book Basic Christianity, says, Anybody who has ever met Jesus Christ only ever had three responses to him. Three. They're either terrified and wanted to run away, or they hated him and wanted to kill him and stone him to death, or they worshipped him and got down on their knees and gave him everything. Everything. Where do you fall in those three slots? No other response is rational. If you don't fall in those three spots, it's not rational. It doesn't make sense. Because you never really thought deep enough about this, who Jesus is. No other response is rational if you see who, who he says he is. If you see him, unless you don't see him as in, in, in exactly who he is. Either you get away from him, or you want to kill him, or you run away from church, or from him, or you worship him. But you don't have the relationship within that many of you. But you, you can't have the relationship within that many of you do. You know, what, is, what it's saying here is you can have the relationship with, with Jesus, but that relationship does not really make sense. Does, it's not totally rational because the response cannot be lukewarm. The response to Jesus cannot be tepid. That's why Jesus said, I wish you were hot or cold. But because you are lukewarm, neither heart of God, I spit you out of my mouth. Book of Revelations. Why did he say that? Because he gave everything. And he only recruits people who give him everything. You can't say, well, it's an interesting person. I'd like to know him better. I think he was some things I need to get through life. I really ought to turn to him. I really ought to turn. I, I ought to make room in my life for him. Now, because of, because of who Jesus claimed to be, Jesus Christ would not allow that kind of lukewarm response. Make sense? Because he is God. He is not going to allow that kind of lukewarm response. Either you give your, yourself to him totally now, or someday you may have to stand before the throne of God and answer that question. Which one do you want? You want to respond to him now, or you answer that question when you face him in the judgment day? And he may be asking you this question. Why did you think you knew better than I how to run your life? That's what you're saying. I gave you many, many chances. I want to bring you in. But you think you can run your own life better the way I, I run your life. That will happen on the judgment throne. There's no answer to that question. Because he created you. He's God. And he's God with us. He is God with us. Some people have died with that on their lips. Died with it on their lips, meaning they could never answer the question. And they died with that question not answered. It means they will have to answer it on the judgment day. I propose you live with that in your heart rather than, rather than die with that in your, in your lips. Let's pray.